Uh, we're going to be in Romans chapter 3. We're going to pick up our study and finish the last little section in that chapter, Romans chapter 3. If you would like a Bible, the ushers will be coming down the aisleways. And uh, as I say every week, uh, feel free to keep that Bible. It's our gift to you if you don't have one of your own. We want you to have God's Word, not just following along here this morning, but every Sunday morning and every Monday morning and all throughout the week as well. You know by now that the theme of the book of Romans is God's good news. Let's try that again. The theme of Romans is God's good news. I don't want you to ever get tired of saying that, thinking that, hearing that. We have good news from God, and it's the story of how a, a righteous God can make unrighteous people righteous, and he does it in a totally righteous way. I know that sounds funny, but that's really what the book of Romans is all about. In fact, in Romans 1.16... We uh, read this. This were the kind of the, the key verses the, that we read in the beginning of our study. I'm not ashamed, says Paul, of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. And then it says, this, is, this good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. And this is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it's through faith that a righteous person has life. And Paul went on to tell us for a couple of chapters some bad news that all the world was guilty before this holy God. All the world stands condemned and under the wrath of God until he puts his faith in God. And this is, this is true for irreligious and immoral people, but it's also true for religious and moral people. It, it's true for uh, a re, the religious skeptic. We, we're all in the same boat. And for some, it's easy to see. Their, their sin looks heinous. For others, their sin looks holier than thou. It, it's not so obvious to them. It may be to other people, but sometimes we can be blinded by our pride. But God sees that attitude of the heart, and he says, hey, look, you can miss my heart and my plan for your life by being very, very bad, and you can miss it by thinking you're very, very good. And, and all of it, there's just something very humbling and sort of leveling uh, as the Lord sets the record straight through the Apostle Paul. And, and uh, this is where we left off last time. Paul wraps up his case, speaking to the religious man, the religious skeptic in particular, who would push back against Paul's teaching on the grounds of his religious heritage, thinking his salvation was secure simply because he was a Jew. Now, we have that same kind of thinking today. Many people do. They believe that because they were born into a religious home, uh, they, they were raised in a religious family, uh, they may have experienced certain religious traditions like confirmation or baptism and all good things, but they think that is what assures salvation. They've lived a good life and so forth. And what does Paul say in verse 19? He says, obviously the law applies to those to whom it was given. For its purpose, listen, its purpose is to keep people from having excuses. Some of your Bibles in the New King James will say uh, that every mouth may be stopped. So you like to justify yourself, and I do too. You like to make excuses about sin, and I do too. You like to think about and boast about and make sure everybody sees your good works. I do too. And Paul says, you know what happens when God weighs in on this conversation? We just shut up. We just stop the boasting. We stop the excuse making. He says in verse 20, no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. There's nothing wrong with the law or obeying the law. But the purpose of the law wasn't to save you. It was to point you to a savior. And that's what we're gonna see uh, today. It simply shows us how sinful we are and how holy God is. Now, I hope that you're not a person who's easily offended. I don't know. If you are easily offended, I, um, I'll just say this. I, it, it makes it difficult to learn. It makes it difficult to change and grow and mature. If you're always defensive and you're easily offended, and, and we all can be at times, 
Do you know the Bible says something very radical? It says the gospel is an offense to those who are perishing. Do you know why? Do you know why that is? Because they're too proud to listen to the truth. The truth, and, 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 and that reality can not only be a lonely thing, it can actually be a damning thing, according to Scripture. If you're not approachable and teachable and humble, nobody, including God, can speak the truth to you in love and have you actually benefit from it. I think of the people in my life that speak the truth in love for me. Uh, of course, my wife. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a wife. <laughs> She's so faithful. She speaks the truth in love. Sometimes that truth is convicting. Sometimes it's encouraging or comforting. But she speaks the truth in love. And sometimes it takes great courage for her to do it. I'm so thankful for a best friend in this life who will speak the truth to me in love. Now, I'm not always humble and teachable. But that's what I long to be. That's what I need to be. Because God put that woman in my life to help me grow up. Now, there's no hope in some ways for me to grow up. <laughs> I haven't grown in a long time. <laughs> hey, did I ever tell you about the time I grew two inches in five minutes? <laughs> did I tell you that story? No. I thought I topped out at 5'2 in, in high school. Stopped growing. I met my girlfriend slash wife-to-be when I was a freshman in college. And we were standing at her parents' house in her bathroom getting ready to go on a date. And she was doing her hair and makeup and stuff. And I'm standing and then we're both looking in the mirror. And I said, how, how tall are you? And she says, five foot six. I said, no, nah, you can't be. I'm five two. There's no way you're five six. And she says, I'm five six. My mom's five six. My sister's five six. Five six. What can I tell you? <laughs> so, we are, so we argued about it. And finally, she said, look, go get a, you know, a, a tape measure and, and measure. Well, I'll prove it to you. So we get a tape measure. Just like that, I was five foot four. One of the greatest days of my life. <laughs> the problem is, as I approach 50, I think I'm shrinking. I think I'm going back to what I was as a sophomore in high school. Well, anyway, I digress. But um, the, <laughs> I think my point was that um, uh, people who speak the truth in love help us grow. Help us grow up in love. And we want to be teachable. We want to be humble. And up to this point, see, Paul has been speaking the truth in love, hasn't he? He's been saying some hard things. And he's taken away all our wiggle room. And he wants us to know we're guilty before a holy God. Now, he's not doing it to condemn us or make us feel lousy about ourselves. He's doing it so it prepares our heart for the good news. The bad news is what makes the good news make sense. And the theological term for, for salvation is just in the book of Romans. It's justification by faith. It's how to be right with God. So that's why I've entitled the message this morning, How to Be Right with God. Now, the whole world wants to know what to do with a guilty conscience. I'm not saying everybody's going to God for that, but I'm just saying everybody wants to know what to do with a guilty conscience. And there's, there's a negative approach and there's a positive approach. See if you can recognize any of these. The negative approach looks like this. Ignore yourself. Yeah, just pretend. I'm not sinning. <laughs> Ignore yourself. Distract yourself. Justify yourself or blame shit. Numb yourself. Sometimes we numb our, those, th that, that guilty conscience with drugs or alcohol. Deceive yourself. The Bible says we're really good at that one. Feel sorry for yourself. Harm yourself. It's, it's, it's been a trendy thing for some years now, this whole cutting phenomenon among teens especially. Harm yourself. That's how you deal with a guilty conscience. It's a lie straight from the pit of hell. But it's a very common thing. In fact, even more tragic, kill yourself. We see, we see you know, that's on the rise, especially among young people. That, that's how much of the world is dealing with a guilty conscience. Is that not incredibly sad? There's a more positive approach. Talk to yourself. Talk about yourself. In the psychological world, they call that talk therapy. It's quite expensive. And eventually, <laughs> you, you, you learn, this, <laughs> I don't have any more money to talk about myself. 
Maybe I'll try something else. I'll try to better myself. A life of good works. Listen, none of these responses is the proper way to deal with guilt. And what do they all have in common? I'll give you a hint. There was a word you heard over and over and over. Self. Self. It's self-salvation. You can't save yourself. I can't either. Do you know guilt is God's way of getting your attention? It's an uncomfortable emotion, isn't it? But it serves God's purpose. He's hardwired us with both a conscience and a complex array of emotions, and they're like blinking lights on the dashboard of our soul. They let us know whether or not we're pleasing our creator. That's why we have emotions. It's his way of helping you know when you've sinned against him, this this emotion of guilt. He's nudging you toward repentance and confession because it's uncomfortable to live under this burden of guilt. And he's saying, you know, I, wanna, I, I, didn't, I didn't create you to live under that kind of a burden. Now, I'm letting you know you have a problem. But the solution to the problem isn't any of those normal responses that I just talked about. The solution is to bring it to the Lord. Turn from your sin. Repent. Confess to the Lord. Agree with him about sin. You see? That's how you deal with guilt. Proverbs 28, 13. People who conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess and forsake or confess and turn from them, they will receive what? Mercy. That's a pretty good idea. 1 John 1, 7, but if we're living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we've not sinned, we're calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. You cannot know the peace of God until you make peace with God. And those verses tell you the way to do it. You confess your sin. He says, I delight in mercy. I'm ready to forgive. I will cleanse your guilty conscience. I will lift that burden. We just go to him and humbly turn from sin and trust him. And when you do this, he justifies you. That means you don't have to justify self anymore. You don't have to make excuses or blame shift or try to explain away things and call sin everything under the sun except what it really is. You just stop justifying yourself and you let him justify you. Well, what exactly is justification? Here's what it is. I put a little definition up there for you. Justification is the act of God whereby he declares the believing sinner righteous in Christ on the basis of the finished work of Christ on the cross. And the first thing I want you to know is this this justification is an act. It's not a process. There are no degrees of justification. Each believer has the same right standing before God. It, it, It is also something God does, not man. We cannot justify ourselves before a holy God. He justifies us. We certainly do try, but it never works. Either we excuse, make too little of our sin, or we make too much of our good deeds. So justification is an act, not a process, and it's something God does, not man. More importantly, justification does not make us righteous. It does not mean that God makes us righteous. It means he declares us righteous. And there's a distinction there that's important to understand. I'm not saying God doesn't make us righteous. I'm just saying that's not what justification means. He doesn't make you righteous through justification. He declares you righteous. I say that because it's a, judi- it's a, it's a judicial term. It, it's, it's something only a judge can do. A judge can just, justify and he can condemn. That's what a judge does. And he says, I don't want to condemn you. Now, there is one who wants to condemn you. Who's that? And the Bible says, for believers, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. There's no condemnation. He's not your judge. God's your judge. Now, he will condemn, or he doesn't want to condemn. Uh, We just sang, uh, or um, Andy just prayed a little bit ago, uh, that verse in John 3, 16 and 17. Jesus came into the world to save the world. He said, I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to save the world. It's your sin that condemns you. 
And God says, I want to justify you. One more thing that I want you to understand is, um, oh, well, first of all, the reason that's good news, that, that God does it and that it can't be changed is you don't have to worry about being condemned. It helps you recognize who's talking. Are you listening to the enemy or are you listening to God? God doesn't condemn you. He will convict you of sin, but that's a very different thing. He will let you know when you're doing the wrong thing and he'll point you in the right direction, but he's not condemning you. You should never despair as a Christian over sin because you're not condemned. One more thing, don't confuse justification with sanctification. I have another definition for you for sanctification. Now, this is a process. Sanctification is the process whereby God makes the believer more and more like Christ. And this takes place day by day. It's a change. How many of you are smack dab in the middle of your sanctification? <laughs> okay, four of you, that's good. Uh, we're hoping, I'm praying for more. Uh, no, no, I'm teasing. It, we all as believers are right in the middle of this messy thing called sanctification. Another way of saying it is just spiritual growth. God is working it out in our lives. And that's different than justification. When a sinner trusts Christ, God declares him righteous. And that, there's a, I don't know who came up with this, but it's kind of cute and clever. Justified means it's justified, never sinned at all. That's a great way to remember that sort of big Bible term, justification. It's, we don't speak like that typically, but it's just that judicial term. It's just your, your position in Christ, you stand before him righteous because of your righteousness? No, because of Jesus' righteousness on your behalf. behalf. And he's gonna now dive in and explain this to us. <clears throat> Verse 21 I'm going to read through these 10 verses. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there's no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by, God, by his blood through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. We'll stop there for now. The first thing I want you to see is the Bible tells us, we're answering the question, how to be right with God. The first thing that I think is important to know, at least in this passage, is the Bible tells us how to be right with God. Notice he's, Paul says, well, first of all, he says, but now, that tells you there's a transition. He's been talking about judgment, and now he's going to talk about justification. He's, he's been uh, giving us the bad news. Now he says, now I want to give you the good news. And he says, and, and Paul is letting us know that it's the Bible that tells us how to be right with God. And he says here that um, it's actually the old, he says that it's been revealed. So previously it was unknown, but now it's been revealed. And it's been witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. I love this. What this tells me is that God's righteousness is, is it's revealed apart from the Old Testament. It, it means that it's, it's apart from the principle of law. It's apart from the legal relationship to God based on the idea that you've got to earn or deserve it. You don't have to huff and puff your way to heaven and work your way into God's good grace. It's, it's, it's apart from that. We don't have a legal relationship with God, but he wants us to have a loving relationship with him. And God's righteousness isn't offered up to us as something to kind of take up the slack in our ability to keep the law. The slack between his law and uh, our ability and his standard. The righteousness of God isn't a supplement to our righteousness. It's important to know that because we can live like that. Well, I'm just going to do my best, God, and I'm going to count on you to do your best, and together <laughs> I'm going to get better, you know, and we think that somehow his righteousness is just a supplement 
Listen, God is liberating us from the crushing burden that comes from our attempts at self-salvation. This is a liberating truth that the righteousness of God is revealed in the scripture and it's, it comes by way of faith. In the Old Testament, righteousness came by behaving. In the gospel, righteousness comes by believing. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God through faith, he says, basically this, this verse tells me we can only be right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us how to be right with God and we can only be right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Now remember, Paul is dealing with, with, with God's chosen people, the Jews, and they insisted that their special position with God uh, sort of guaranteed their eternal salvation. Simply being a Jew was enough. And he's correcting this false belief. And, and he's letting them know that God is ushered in a new age. And it's, it's, it's something different. And he's going to forgive, he's going to make people righteous on the basis of faith in Christ alone. And I'll tell you what, that is good news. And I like to say it's not good advice. He's not saying to go out and do something. He's, it's a report of something that's already been done. It's not about what you do for God. It's about what he's done for you already in Christ. I like that. And, it's, and the righteousness of God, notice this, it's not ours by faith, it's ours through faith. And, and why does that matter? Because we don't earn righteousness by faith. It, it, it's a subtle thing, but it's really um, important to understand the distinction. Some people are trying to walk by faith, but in their mind they're thinking, I'm going to earn Salvation if I just try hard to be a good Christian. The reason it says through faith is because Paul wants us to know we receive righteousness. It's a gift. So the hands of faith aren't given to work to earn salvation. The hands of faith reach out to receive salvation. It's a gift. Now, if you've received justification, if you've re by faith, if you've received this gift, your faith will go to work, but your motive will be different. It'll be love and gratitude for God. God wants us to be busy serving him and serving the kingdom and, and living for eternal things. And we should be working hard in our faith to help lead other people to faith. But that's different than working for our salvation. You understand? It's, it's, it's really a significant uh, distinction that we need to get straight. And notice it's also in this verse, anyone who believes in Jesus Christ can be right with God. Notice he says it's for all, and there's no difference between Jew or Gentile. So anyone, that's good news. You know, there's people today that, that think to themselves, you know, I have just been a, a terrible person. Pastor, you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. Uh, the kind of life that I've lived. I mean, I'm just not sure God would love me. God would receive me. That he would actually welcome me. This scripture tells us that this, this righteousness of God that comes through faith, it's available to everybody. And, and Paul, in so many ways, it was hard for them to believe. It seemed too good to be true. And... Yet it was. He said there's no difference. The gospel's universal because man's need is universal. There's only one cure, the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what gives us righteousness. Now, the next thing I want you to see in verse 23 is all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. This tells us that apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ, nobody can be right with God. So, I just said that some people think, well, I could never you know, be made right with God because of the way I've lived. There's other people that think, yeah, I'm good with God. I've lived a good life. I don't really need this whole, you know, prayer of repentance and, you know, all that stuff. Me and God are good. You know what? If that's the way you think, you're not good with God. Nobody can be right with God apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's a whole world out there trying to get to God on their own terms, not on God's terms. 
They're trying to be a good person, and they, they're, they're chasing, uh, they're, they're being very religious. There's a lot of religions, and they all have this in common. It's a works-based right, righteousness. It's salvation by works. In that sense, it's self-salvation. And, and I'll tell you, there's a really broad appeal. I'll tell you why that is in just a minute. Paul says, all fall short. And it's in, the, it's in the present tense, which is interesting in the Greek language, because it means keep on falling short. It's not just, well, I kind of, you know, fell short yesterday. I, you know, I'll try harder today. He's saying you're going to keep on falling short. That's the way it is before we come to faith in Christ. And our, our sin keeps us from reaching God's glory. Now, this can mean a couple of things. It may mean that, that we fall short of God's approval, it can also mean we simply don't reflect his glory the way we were made to. Do you remember all the way back in Genesis, we were created in God's image. We were created to reflect the glory of God, and the Bible says one day we will. Right now, it's kind of murky. We can't quite see what we're going to be, but when we see Jesus, we're going we're, we're to be like him, and we're going to reflect again the glory of God that he created us for. But if you don't think that you've fallen short of God's glory, there's a simple way to disprove it, okay? Really easy. Well, simple. Here it is. Are you ready? Just stop sinning. <laughs> you won't be able to do it. I've tried. <laughs> I can't stop. <laughs> We're all in the same boat, though. Well, H, a, a guy by the name of Mool, um, Hadley Mool, he said this, great pastor, he said, the harlot, the liar, the murderer are short of it, but so are you. Perhaps they stand at the bottom of a mine and you on the crest of an alp, but you are as little able to touch the stars as they. How true that is, I like that. Well, Paul's gonna develop the rest of his teaching around three themes, justification, Redemption and propitiation. Try to say that five times fast. That's a big word. It's a tongue twister. Justification is an image from the court of law. Remember I said that this, it's a judicial act from a judge? Redemption is an image from the slave market, which in their culture they would have really understood. Propitiation is an image from the world of religion. In the Greco-Roman world especially, it, it was just understood that you have to appease these angry gods. Okay, and, and that's what propitiation is all about. Justification solves the problem of man's guilt before a righteous judge. Redemption solves the problem of man's slavery to sin and the world and Satan. Both important terms, but so is this one. Propitiation. It solves the problem of man's offending his creator. And so, so Paul, you need to understand, Paul is packing a whole lot of theology in just a very few verses. But it's really important for us to have a firm foundation and an understanding of the gospel. In verse 24, the next thing we see is that we can be right with God by his grace alone, not any merit of our own. He said being justified freely by his grace and I love this. Just like a moment ago, we kept falling short. It was a, a continual thing. This uh, is in the present tense as well. And what Paul's saying is we keep on being declared righteous. So it's, it's an ongoing thing. God has declared you righteous, and it'll continually be that way. I like that. And um, what is it that makes it possible? This free gift. Grace is unmerited, undeserved favor, as uh, many of you know. It's one of Paul's favorite words. He uses it 24 times in the book of Romans. Grace. The, sixth, the next thing I want you to see is we can be right with God by trusting that Jesus purchased our forgiveness and freedom with his own blood. Mm. That's, so he, he's, he's telling us the source of our justification is God and his grace. And now he's saying the basis for our justification is Christ in the cross. In a minute, he's gonna say the, the means of our 
Justification is faith. And all three of those are very, very important to understand. What's the source? Where does it come from? God and his grace. That's how we're able to be made right with God. If God wasn't gracious and benevolent and a good, good father, as we just sang about, we could never be made right with God. He's the initiator. We're called to simply respond to what he initiates. We learned in, earlier in chapter 3, nobody seeks God. They might seek enlightenment. They might seek an emotional experience. They, people seek a lot of things. But nobody actually seeks God. If they did, they'd be reading the Bible and, and, and letting God speak for himself. But nonetheless, his grace enables us to begin seeking after him. And we can be right with God by trusting that Jesus purchased our forgiveness and freedom. And he did it with his own blood. Now, redemption, this is that other term. Redemption means a ransom payment. It originated with the idea of like um, prisoners of war being released from their captivity and, and there was a price to pay for that. It came to mean in their culture um, in a similar way the idea of a slave being purchased out of the slave market so they could be rescued. But the idea is he, he pays a ransom. There's a cost to what's this transaction and, and we're totally helpless. We can't set ourselves free. We can't pay the cost. We owed a debt we couldn't pay, so Jesus paid the debt he did not owe. We owed that debt. And what was, what was the cost? Now listen, it's, people talk about grace, and they say, well, that's, that's cheap. That's cheap. But the fact that it's free, that it's freely given, it's cheap. Just because something's freely given doesn't mean it's cheap. I told you guys a story of a, 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 a sweet um, gal who gave us a, a bedroom set. My wife just wanted a bedroom set for decades, and we just never, you know, there's so much money, and we're like, we just, there's just were other priorities. I mean, we just weren't going to go out and plunk down, you know, $5,000 or whatever for a bedroom set. And, uh, and a brother was coming to church one day, and he, he said, hey, he had a little classified poster, and he, I said, what's that? And he says, well, it's a bedroom set. A relative of his was giving away a bedroom set. And I looked at it, and I said, don't put that on the bulletin board. <laughs> Sold to the little guy. I, and, and so, so I went, and, and it was an amazing bedroom set, and far more than, than anything we would have ever been able to afford. I said, I, but I, I offered to pay, and she said, no way, absolutely not. It was so valuable. And I felt kind of embarrassed. I felt awkward. I'm like, we can't take this. This is too nice. And, but inside I'm going, oh, I really want this. It's so nice. Now, listen, the point being, the fact that it was free doesn't mean it was cheap. It was incredibly valuable. And I'm so thankful. That is one of the best examples of grace in my life. Just a practical illustration. And that's exactly, well... <laughs> How much more valuable is the gift of justification? We simply entrust ourselves to Jesus. We're persuaded, we're convinced that he is able to forgive us and to free us and we just take him at his word and our hands of faith open up and we say, I receive it, Lord. All you have to do is be humble enough to receive it. Maybe today, for some of you, is the day that you receive forgiveness and freedom. The fact that he redeemed you, he paid a ransom, and that he did it freely by grace, it doesn't mean it's cheap. It just means you're blessed, potentially, with that great, great gift. Now, the last thing that he talks about, oh, by the way, have you ever heard this? Probably you have, but um, a great little acronym for, for grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. And that's the idea in these verses. The ransom that was paid was the blood of Jesus. And it was grace that made it possible. Well, verse 25, God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance God passed over the sins that were previously committed. 
This reminds us that God wants everyone to see the way to be right with him. How do we know that? Because he set it forth. And that, that term in the Greek means it was, it was made public for all to see. Do you remember, and propitiation means, it's, it's a big word, but it's real simple what it means. It means to satisfy through sacrifice. To satisfy by sacrifice. Do you remember in the Old Testament how they did that? With the tabernacle, the, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies one time a year on the Day of Atonement. And he would, there was the Ark of the Covenant and it had the mercy seat, the lid on the top of the Ark. And, and he would sprinkle the blood of a goat and it was all just symbolism. And, and the idea was, and inside, remember, there was Aaron's bud, or rod that had budded. There is the, the, two tab, uh, the Ten Commandments, the two tables of stone, and manna. And all of that was symbolic. But the, the idea in this context here is that man had broken God's law. And the only way for sin to be atoned for or covered was through sacrifice. Now, the blood of bulls and goats, the Bible says, could never atone for man's sin. But it placated the wrath of God towards sin for a season of time. But all of the Old Testament sacrifices were pointing to a day when the Lamb of God would come and take away the sins of the world. And the reason he says he was forbearing is because God waited all those years. And, and he was very patient because he, didn't, he, he wanted to give people time. And he was anticipating that a savior was coming. And so he, it all pointed to Jesus. And that's the idea of propitiation here. He's saying you're justified. And this is part of the package. God covers your sin. God, there was a, a great old pastor, Dr. G. Campbell Morgan. He was trying to explain this idea of free salvation to a coal miner. But the man was unable to understand it. He said, I have to pay for it. He argued with Pastor Morgan, and with a flash of divine insight, Dr. Morgan asked, how did you get down into the mine this morning? Why, it was easy, the man replied. I just got on the elevator and went down. And Morgan asked, wasn't that too easy? Didn't it cost you something? The man laughed, no, it didn't cost me anything. Must have cost the company plenty, though, to install the elevator. Then the man saw the truth. It doesn't cost me anything to be saved, but it cost God the life of his son. And so this idea of redemption and propitiation, <clears throat> that's what it's all about. A couple more and we'll be done. God is completely righteous in the way he makes us righteous. That's what verse 26 is all about. To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of one who has faith in Jesus. And so... A person might be tempted to look and say, well, that just doesn't seem fair. That's not right. Why would God just, you know, forgive people's sins? Or why would God send people to hell? You see the two extremes? You could imagine a just judge just sending everybody to hell. And people saying, wait a minute, that doesn't seem right. Or you could imagine a judge that's really lenient and just letting everybody go scot-free. Well, that doesn't seem right either. We cannot reconcile these two things, but God in Christ on the cross did that. It's where justice and mercy meet. And all at once, he reconciled people to himself. And, and at the same time, he demonstrated justice by punishing sin and extraordinary mercy by pardoning sinners. And then he wraps up these last few verses. Verse 27, where is boasting then? It's excluded. By what law? Of works? No. By the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the law, God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there's one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Paul says, where's the boasting? Again, he's anticipating his readers pushing back a little bit and asking questions. And basically the idea here is God gets all the credit for making us right with him. He says a similar thing in Ephesians where he says, you're saved by grace through faith and that not of yourself. And he says, why? 
so that nobody can brag about it. Nobody can boast. And you know that's exactly what we do. <laughs> we just tend to do that. God gets all the credit for making us right with him. And he says <clears throat> in verse 28, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. So we can be right with God, not by our own good works, but only by trusting in his work on the cross. That's the idea. And then finally, or uh, 20, oops, I'm jumping ahead here. God wants all people to be right with him through faith. So all people, he's the God of Gentiles and Jews. And then last but not least, verse 31 when we come into a right relationship with God through faith, we fulfill the purpose of his word. So if you are a, a follower of Jesus today, it's not because you earned a relationship with God. It's because you put your faith in him, in Jesus, and the sacrifice that he made for you on the cross. And when you did that, you fulfilled the purpose of his word. Because God's word, you heard the gospel, you heard the gospel story, you, you heard about what God required, and you said, you know what, I can't do that on my own. I need Jesus in order to live the Christian life. That was the whole point of God's law, was simply to point us to Christ. So if you're a follower of Jesus today, you've fulfilled, the purpose of God's word was fulfilled through your life. Uh, Galatians uh, tells us that it was like a tutor to lead us to Christ. So how to be right with God? By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Someone once said that, that coming to this saving relationship with Jesus is as easy as the ABCs. Have you heard this before? A stands for admit. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You just admit. You agree with God. Yep, I'm a sinner. You believe. You believe in your heart. And belief means to be persuaded by the truth. It becomes compelling to you. It's not just sort of an intellectual nod. It's, it's saying, yes, I, I believe I'm willing to entrust myself to Christ. And C is just call on the name of the Lord. Listen to Romans 10, 9, 13. And we'll close with this in prayer. Paul says, and that message is the very message about faith that we preach. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you're made right with God, and it's by openly declaring your faith that you're saved. As the scripture tells us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's stand together. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. There's just a whole bunch there, but it, it's all good for our soul and necessary for us to grow and mature in our understanding. All of these concepts and ideas trickle down into our life in very practical ways. Lord, we can find ourselves defaulting to self-salvation many times. Or we think we've just got to try harder or do better. And, and Lord, it, it snatches away our joy and, and it, it gets us focused on the wrong things. Instead of focusing on you, we start to focus on ourselves or our, our circumstances or other people. And, and, and nobody else can be our Savior. You alone can be our Savior. I pray, Lord, that you would put saving faith in people's heart this morning. Maybe there's some who've come this morning and, and they learned, they learned some things this morning they never knew before. And my prayer would be that if they learn nothing else, they learn that you love them and that you've made a way for them to be in a right relationship with you. I pray, Lord, that you would put it in their heart to seek after you and to simply turn from their sin and confess their need for a savior. And may they just by faith invite you to forgive their sin and to be their Lord and savior. Thank you, Lord, that you died on the cross for us and that you rose from the grave. You conquered sin, you conquered death, you conquered Satan. We have a living savior. Our God isn't a dead God or a figment of our imagination or someone just back in the dusty bins of history, but you are the true and living God, our creator. 
and we can know you today by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And we thank you for these liberating truths. We pray, Lord, that you'd bless them to our hearts. Help us to walk in them. Help us to make others aware of them too, to make you known. We want to know you and we want to make you known. In Jesus' name, amen.